All right, so last time in the title of my video, I made a promise and it was that I was gonna be delivering the theory of machine learning. And we started with Hilbert spaces and in that video we talked about the Hilbert projection theorem. But it's really abstract. And in fact, I, I can tell that it did, the message didn't necessarily get across just by looking at the comments. What I want to do today is I want to go ahead and tell you how you can do a best approximation using Hilbert space theory. And we're going to start with some data and learn a function. Now, this method of finding uh, best approximations with Hilbert spaces uh, is very standard. And so I could change the Hilbert space and keep the same algorithm. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting with a function and we're going to look at it as a function from zero to one. And we're going to be trying to get a polynomial approximation of it using its moments. The moments come up all the time in statistics and physics and in a lot of different places. So this is a very common problem and a very important problem. And we have actually even seen a resolution to the same problem where we get a polynomial approximation of a function using its moments when I showed you the Weierstrass approximation theorem and that full proof there. But that proof, while it is constructive and it does actually give us an approximation of the function, is actually a very bad way of using the data that we have. This algorithm at the end of that figure is I, I think it's like a 360 degree polynomial. So it should be a, a nothing gap. We shouldn't be able to see it. Uh, despite how historically interesting this proof is and how close it is to the Weierstrass proof, uh, it still isn't a, a very good algorithm to use. But we can do better. And that's what this Hilbert space method is supposed to do. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a monomial basis from, going from one up to say X to the N. And we're gonna be looking for the best linear combination uh, that will approximate f with respect to the L2 norm. And so the Hilbert space theory and the projection theorem is really what comes in to guarantee one, that we can find this approximation, and two, that is unique. If we look at the Hilbert projection theorem itself, I mean, it's about finding, we were talking about a closed subspace of a Hilbert space, and we are looking for the sort of, uh, the point inside of that closed subspace that is closest to our function. Now, closed subspace is very abstract. And this is a bit more of a concrete problem. And it turns out anytime you have a finite dimensional subspace of a Hilbert space, it is actually a closed subspace. And so in this case, our closed subspace is the space of polynomials of degree no more than that. And that's what we're working with. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show it to you on the board, show you how we can get this approximation. It should only take a minute. And, uh, okay, a minute or two. I'm not very good at promising in these minutes, but y you get the idea. And then we're gonna look at this in code. And I'm gonna compare the answer we're gonna get out of here to the, the problem in the Weierstrass approximation theorem that we did a few videos ago. And I'm gonna show you that this actually does a lot better as far as finding a good approximation of F. They both do it, but you remember the Weierstrass approximation theorem, I think we had to get like hundreds of degrees in order to get any sort of like reasonable approximation of a continuous function on the closed interval, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Let's go ahead and, uh, well, I get to, uh, well, let's get to it. Okay. So here's the setting. So we are working over functions from zero to one, and we want to get a good approximation of f in terms of a polynomial. And we're going to be working with this inner product here, the integral uh, from zero to one of f of t times g of t bar. Now, g of t bar, it's so technically this is supposed to be complex valued functions. We're going to just be working with real functions this whole time. So I, I really don't need to worry about the bar, and so it won't really come up in our computations. But this is, strictly speaking, the L2 inner product. And so we are going to be looking for the minimizer of this. Now, we don't have to write just in FEMA. We can write minimum because we, our last theorem told us that as long as we're operating over a closed subspace, and so this is a subspace generated by the monomials, and since it's finite dimensional is closed, that means that we are guaranteed that there is actually a proper minimum to find. So that's what we're looking for. And so what we do is we take the difference between f and this polynomial. Uh, we suppress the t over here. We just write it over here because we don't have a contained inside of another function. But basically we have f minus this polynomial, and we want to basically minimize the norm. This is the L2 norm uh, given by, uh, say, you know, if you take f in your product it itself, that's going to give you the L2 norm. So then we're going to take the minimum over all of these guys, and now we want to get into a nice equation where we can actually do that 
uh, where it's pretty obvious what we need to do. So in order to get out of this abstract setting, what we first do is we expand it in terms of the inner product, which gives us this. Now I can take this and I can expand this uh, using linearity on this side and this side, and it, and it gives me uh, this equation here. So uh, we're going to have the norm of f squared. That's coming out. And uh, let me real quick write everything else. So uh, this is what we have now. So we expand everything out. Uh, basically, you're going to get, uh, I, I, I turned everything into matrix form because it's a little bit easier to, to read. But basically, what you get is you're going to have this double sum coming out of here. You're going to have, say, the norm of f coming out of here. Uh, you're going to have uh, f inner product with the sum of wi ti. And then you're also going to have, say, the summation of wi wj against ti tj. So all of these guys are going to pop out. And so this guy turns into the sum of wi of f against ti. And so then we turn this into a vector notation uh, like this, where this just captures all of our weights and our w's. And over here, uh, this whole thing actually is exactly this. And you can work that out from this way down to here. And uh, of course, we're still taking a minimum. And so what you can do is, we're, so we're looking for the w that's going to minimize all this stuff, right? And so we can call that w star if you want. And if we find this w star, and let's call this, this huge equation, uh, we'll call this capital F of w. And uh, so what we're trying to do is try and minimize capital F of w. And when we do that, uh, we can find this w star. We'll assume w star minimizes, which then tells us that the gradient of f with respect to w star should be equal to zero. So what I can do is I can take the gradient of this, set it equal to zero, and then find the w star. That's not too bad. So we get minus two times this vector of just f inner product with all of our basis functions, uh, plus the gram matrix that we talked about before. That was a big matrix with all the pairwise inner products, and uh, this times w star, uh, and should come with a two. Sorry about that. So now what we can do is we move this over, cancel the twos, and invert this over. This is invertible because it's a gram matrix, and gram matrices are invertible as long as the basis functions are linearly independent. So what I can do then is I can get w star is equal to this inverse of ti tj matrix, you know, this whole thing, against uh, f against t0 down to f against tn, right? So if I can compute this, and I can make this matrix, I can invert it against this vector if I can compute this, and then that's this. So what is this guy? Well, we have uh, f inner product with t, say, to the little m, is going to be the integral of t to the m times f of t dt, integral from 0 to 1. That is the mth moment of f, and so this is what we're going to be considering as our data. And so these all go in here. This is where your data goes in. And this is all dependent on your basis functions. And these guys are all, say, t i, say, t j is the integral from 0 to 1 of t i times t j dt. So t i plus j dt. And so if we can compute this, we get this, and that's easy enough to do. You can even do that by hand. I mean, heck, let's just do it right now. So we get t i plus j plus 1 divided by i plus j plus 1. And then we're evaluating this as 0 and 1. And that really just puts this as being just a 1 here. And there you go. So, so this matrix is just these guys, pretty easy. And, uh, and this is the data that we're given. And so we can just easily compute this w star. And if we use this w star terms, and so then that will give us this. And so, so let's say that f of t is, should be approximately the sum of w i star t to the i, i going from 0 up to capital N. And so now let's see how this actually works out. Now there's some caveats here that I'm not going to get into, but you know, in, this is close in the sense of an L2 norm. Maybe not point-wise. We don't know exactly yet. But it should work out pretty well point-wise too. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into MATLAB and you know, see how this algorithm actually does. All right. So here I'm going to show you a bunch of MATLAB code that I did for the L2 best approximations. And we're also going to compare it to some of the code I did for the Weierstrass approximation. And I'm going to demonstrate to you uh, sort of the 
difference in approximation abilities between these two methods and it's it's insane how much better the l2 approximation is now the l2 approximation is the best approximation with respect to the l2 norm that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the best approximation we're ever going to see with respect to other norms so if i look at the point wise norm it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better than other ones but as long as we're talking about the l2 norm we are guaranteed that what we're finding is as good as it gets so depending on how you're actually judging the quality of the approximation it could be different so we might see the wire straws being a little bit better we're not going to see that uh than the l2 approximation because the l2 approximation doesn't say anything about you know getting really good close point wise convergence but it does actually achieve good point wise approximation so let, let's go ahead and, and take a look all right so right here is code let me walk you through it real quick um we have this funky construction for the function we're approximating so we have this guy uh so essentially it's a, a bunch of sinusoids in, in here with a little linear term thrown in for fun and um i initially made it so it fit from zero to three i didn't like that so i made it so zero to one so we've uh this sort of compression here and then I also just kind of wanted it to be zero at zero and zero at one so I multiplied all of it by these two terms here which is going to sort of fix those those points all right so that's the function we have it's basically a sinusoid and we're forcing it to pinch at uh, zero and one and uh, we have a step size of 0 0.1 and um, and then that's all of our time points so we're looking at sort of the hundred time points between zero and one with spacing 0 0.01 and so real quick i could even just plot that for you so if i just go ahead and divide with this selection and boom there you go so this is what the function looks like and this is the same function i used in the wirestrass approximation theorem so we can have a straight comparison here next thing we're going to do is we're going to start looking at uh the stuff with the simpsons rule in order to find the moments of a function uh we're assuming that the data that we're using are actually moments now we know what the actual function is here but we need to generate data in order to use it and you in order to use this method so we need to make these uh moment integrals and so the moment integrals are basically a function times uh, a power function and then integrated from zero to one one of the best integrators we can use is simpson's rule it has a very very high accuracy especially for the number of samples that you're getting and so we're going to use that and um and then here I'm going to run you through a range of polynomial approximations. We're going to watch it evolve as we go from polynomial 1 up to 15. And so that we'll see an increase in the approximation here. I have to define this parameter here so I know how many moments to generate. So uh, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take my monomials and multiply it by my function. And these are evaluating at our time points, t. And then I multiply them together. And that's what this pointwise this entry wise pairwise multiplication is here and after that um i i'm just plotting it so you can see what they look like so we will see the evolution of uh what these functions look like as we are going to be getting the areas under their curves and then down here is where i actually get the areas under the curve uh, basically i'm just implementing the simpsons rule by just multiplying entry wise by the simpsons rule vector that we made up here and then you multiply by h over three and in your golden uh, so yeah, let's see what these uh, moment uh, functions look like. Bit on the play. So there you go. So you see, as we multiply by t to the k or t to the i for higher higher powers of t, it's going to be flattening out everything by the origin. So things are going to get very very zero at zero, and then you're going to have smaller contributions. Uh, further out and so the higher moments of the function are going to have smaller and smaller contribution here now what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to compute our approximations so in order to compute these approximations i'm going to go from one to the largest degree so i'm going to start with the just a linear approximation get to quadratic approximation all the way up to largest degree which is degree 15 here in order to do this i need to have sort of my data vector that's going to be my b and this is going to have all of my moments. So it's going to be a stack of my moments. And so that's good. Now I'm going to need a gram matrix. And so here, this is the matrix that you get with the inner products between TI and TJ. And when you compute that inner product according to L2 inner product, then the ultimate result is 1 over I plus J plus 1. So easy to compute. And that's exactly what goes in here. All right. Then after we have that, we can find the weights. Uh, just by using this inverse of the gram matrix, I get my approximation of the function, which are my monomials here times our weights. And then uh, just a matter of evaluating this at our point so we can see what it looks like. So let's go ahead and run this code. All right, so 
Let's so gonna go ahead and evaluate it, and then we're gonna see the evolution of our approximation from a degree one polynomial all the way up to degree 15. And so it should look pretty good. All right, here we go. So that's linear, quadratic, cubic, quartic, quintic. I, I can't do the rest, but there you go. By about degree nine to 10, you really can't see any difference between the original function and our approximation anymore. So by degree 10, I think we're doing pretty good. Um, I mean, if we zoom in, we might find some error, but it looks like uh, even though we had guarantees of L2 norm being small, we actually got a good point-wise convergence here. So that, that is good. All right, so now let's compare it to what we have with the Weierstrass approximation. Um, I'm not going to run you through the code too much here. The, it, just go back and watch the video on the Weierstrass approximation theorem. It's a really cool theorem, and the, this is a really slick way to prove the theorem. And it uses uh, some notions that you're going to need later on in your analysis journey, like the uh, approximate identity arguments that come up. And that, that happens a lot in functional analysis. So uh, I recommend you go watch that video right now, uh, well, well, after this one. And, uh, but for now, uh, I'm just gonna run the code and it'll give you uh, the different kinds of approximations that you can get. And here we're gonna be running from uh, not just one to 15, but one to 360. And we're still gonna be a bit off. Um, and so let's go ahead and take a look. And so here we, don't, we see on the left-hand side, we don't even match that bump yet. That hasn't even come up and we are like, well into our approximations. Every new frame here is another higher degree of our approximation. Now you just don't see much of a change uh, with these higher degrees. Now this is using the same data, the moments here, and this is using hundreds of moments by this point. And it's, it's ridiculous how far away this is, where we use those same moments to generate a different approximation using polynomials. And so we were able to better leverage that data when we were doing it with the L2 uh, approximation, you get the best approximation in L2. And so uh, it actually is still going and I'm still talking. We're getting slightly closer and closer and closer as we go. And I think it'll take, honestly, we're gonna still end up with this gap here and it's not gonna go away. All right, yeah. So it really shows you how bad this Weierstrass approximation is. Now I can make this work to extent. So, I mean, uh, I can make, I can take this uh, even further here. Let's just take this to be say one, thousand so at a thousand you see it still hasn't done it yet and so we still have a gap there so let's take it up to a uh, polynomial degree 10,000 it's kind of ridiculous but uh, it'll, it'll work eventually there we go so for 10,000 you can't tell the difference between the original function and the approximation and this finally matches what we found when we were using a degree 15 polynomial using best approximations so this is so much ridiculously better uh, than using this algorithm that we saw Rudin introduce in his principles of mathematical analysis. And so, so, so I, I encourage you to check out uh, Rudin's uh, proof and his book. And I think it, it serves as a lot of as an excellent example of how you can use operators for approximations, which is kind of my shtick. But uh, it's not a great algorithm in this case. Uh, yeah. So that that is a comparison of those two. And if you want to find the code. Uh, to the L2 approximation, uh, you can find it in the link in the description here. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to include this one. You can find the the code for the Wireshaw stuff in my um, in the Wireshaw video description, so you can go find that there. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump back to me in the office. Okay, so that is finding a best approximation inside of Hilbert space, and this theory is actually you know, flexible in that, you know, you can swap out, uh, you know, the Hilbert space and change the basis functions and the algorithm stays exactly the same. You still have to compute that gram matrix and otherwise uh, you have to do a little bit of inversion and, you know, all that good stuff. But as long as we're working on a finite dimensional space and uh, the Hilbert space is real valued, uh, then uh, all of these, this whole algorithm just flows through with no problem. In any case, I want to thank you so much for watching this video and you know taking the time out of your day. I, I really do appreciate it. If you liked it, please drop a like, consider subscribing, and otherwise, I hope you have a great day.